All right, everyone, it's um, the top of the hour, and so I want to give us as much time as we can for our webinar today. A couple housekeeping rules. We've all come in unmuted, so if you could please mute, that means we'll have the, the best ability to hear um, the recording and the, uh, and the webinar today. So thank you so much for joining us. It is July 24th, and we have with us today Andrea Malmberg, who's a savory field professional, and she's going to be sharing with us uh, the, the history and context of EOV. And, and also, all, we can have a discussion then about all the different ways that we can use it, um, because sometimes we think of it um, as only applicable to one program or one thing, but really, it, it, there's so much potential. So uh, without further ado, Andrea, I'll turn it over to you, and we can start our conversation about EOV. Hello, everyone. Um, I actually see, I probably should have asked some permission from pictures I'm using. I see some people that are in my presentation. So, um, um, but I didn't. So you'll be surprised, um, Mimi, for one. <laughs> so I'm going to share my presentation with you. I'm, um, so An Andrea Malmberg, I live in beautiful um, Northeastern Oregon. And I'm a cattle rancher. I'm with my husband, Tony, and um, uh, sort of a, sh a sheep farmer, mostly um, to use in my orchard. And, um, and we have been raising grass head, grass fed beef for um, many years, 20 some years. So I just want to um, give you a little background of why we do monitoring and, um, and kind of our history of doing monitoring. Um, really how I look at it is it is um, a, a place for me to really get creative and inspiration uh, in some regeneration. I think that by looking at the ecosystem processes, we have this um, real amazing ability to, um, uh, for discovery and, um, and kind of understand the mystery of, of the um, earth that we're managing. So um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go deep into EOV, but um, basically it is just a way for us to really inform um, our, our management. And in holistic management, we've been doing biological monitoring from the very beginning um, as probably most, if not all of you know, we look at um, a, a, a feedback loop for how we plan, how we monitor, control, and replan. And so we're always just managing for really um, what we want in terms of our future resource base. I, at part of my future resource base, is that I want functional ecosystem processes. I want to be able to tell people when they say how much precip did you get that I can say I get all, all of it and in order to do that I need to have a covered soil surface. So, <laughs> um, so as I said we have been doing biological monitoring at, in holistic management from the very very beginning and um, this is Mimi on her bison ranch. She has some of the um, oldest data that I know. And uh, a few years ago, um, several years ago, actually, I asked her, I guess it was two, 2012, when we um, at the Savory Institute um, asked her if we could do a case study. And so um, she has worked with Kurt Gazia for a very long time. And I, she had all of her data and I put it into an Excel spreadsheet and I just recall her saying, wow, I knew things were getting better, but I didn't know they were getting this much better. So um, we look at, you know, in terms of percent their ground, um, drastic in, um, decrease in their ground and um, the plant spacing getting closer and closer together. This is my husband, Tony, with the sage grouse. And um, so we used to ranch in, Mon in Wyoming. And um, we, uh, like many, um, I think this is, I mean, this is almost probably 20 years ago. Um, 
we were, even though we had increased the, um, the um, number of stock days, um, we doubled our, our, our stocking rate. Um, there was more and more question of whether or not um, sage grouse could handle uh, having grazing. And so we started realizing we had our data from our holistic management data, but they said, oh, that's just not rigorous enough. And so um, it, this is a sage grouse that's at a lack actually. And um, looking at um, what we ended up finding out is that the sage grouse, um, the hands traveled, um, you know, 20 some miles to find the best nesting habitat. So even though that the, they are, um, are their lack or their breeding grounds are always in the same place, they would travel in order to find the best place. Holistic management informed our ability to look at what the weak link was in the life cycle of sage grouse. And what they really needed is to have forbs small forbs as well as insects when um, during the early brood rearing stage. They needed to have some cover but they couldn't have such wolfy grass um, that would inhibit them from moving. So um, we were able to, with our monitoring data, um, be able to identify what is the absolute best for the sage grouse. And what ended up happening, happening is because of holistic plan grazing, um, we created habitat for, that's one of the, at the time, was um, some of the best habitat for the threatened sage, sage grouse. So what we tr ended up doing is taking um, the, the typical data that the indicators that had, had informed our management so much and um, started to develop a, a more rigorous uh, way of, of looking at um, this data. And so this is again in Wyoming um, and you can see we started a data platform and had um, people put in their, their monitoring data um, so that they too could go to the BLM or just be able to have that kind of third party monitoring. I think this was in 2001. Kind of um, simultaneously, um, Land EKG came on board, and um, so and, and so Charlie Orchard and uh, Land EKG had developed, and that still has um, a, a quite rigorous monitoring system and um, a way to enter that data. So again, that entering the data is really important as well, and so. Um, we used um, Land EKG and, um, and at, on our places, but we also, when um, Grasslands LLC, the management arm of Savory Institute, um, started to look at what kind of monitoring um, with, so this is, you know, probably 2013 maybe, um, we looked at with the Savory Institute, how do we have this full spectrum monitoring? And really at that time, um, Land EKG was probably the most um, rigorous that we had. So then in, in 2016, there were things that we just needed to be able to look at um, more effectively. And so in 2016, we teamed up with Ovis 21. Um, they were one of the first hubs and started to see if we could take um, the monitoring and make it so that it was publishable, that it could really gather um, the kind of information information that land managers really need to have so that we no longer would really be confronted with um, this idea that it's all anecdotal, um, but really that we are able to see one, how do we get um, context, how can we be contextual yet still show patterns um, all over the world. So this is at um, Michigan State. Um, we had people from, um, we had the uh, the hub from 
Great Britain and um, the, the Scandinavian hub, um, uh, Spencer Smith from Jefferson Center. Um, so, and, and we were all able to really um, talk and, and really be kind of intellectual about what is the process of creating a new um, way to monitor. So, um, and this was last year at the West Bijou Ranch, um, Savory's Ranch. Um, so we do do soil testing too. And um, as you can see, um, it was a little hard to do, <laughs> get a soil sample in this one. So let me just give um, a little overview then of, of what EOV um, has become. This is um, uh, Spencer and um, Isadora from Molina from um, Chile on our ranch doing, um, this was last year, doing our uh, baseline monitoring. So EL, ELV um, reflects this commitment to land education and also having that support. So it is being able to learn from each other as land managers. Um, it's being able to really be outcome based. So as the name implies that it's the verification is not like jumping through some hoops. It's actually saying, okay, how am I, um, what am I doing to actually get to that future resource base that I desire? It's also very contextually relevant. So every, I'll show a little bit more about what that means, but every um, place that you monitor is um, looking at what that eco region will support. So I was just down in in the Great Basin, and um, that required a whole different kind of evaluation um, uh, met metrics because the Great Basin is different than um, the eco region that I am in. And then this, it's also very um, steward first. Um, and so, as um, this is Tony and Spencer um, looking at manure <laughs> and um, but just really being able to try to understand what is the ecosystem processes going on and how can this data um, be rigorous enough to stand up in a court of law to be published but also how can it really uh, um, change our management and form our management. So the metrics that we um, look at, um, first of all, we do have both short-term monitoring and long-term monitoring. And so the first year you um, have your baseline and um, these indicators are you know, very similar to, um, to what we've been using in the biological monitoring for um, since holistic management started. Um, we're looking at how much in terms of live canopy abundance, how much are we really seeing um, that can capture sunlight. Um, the living organisms, so the microfauna that are breaking down um, manure, but also the microfauna that are pollinators. Um, we look at um, the vigor and reproduction of contextually desired functional groups of plants. So that would be your, um, warm season and cool season grasses, um, if you have both, or for, in, for example, where we are, um, our cool season grasses, and we look at forbs as well as legumes and trees and brush. Um, and then we look at what is really contextually desirable um, plants that, that we want, and also some of those contextually undesirable species. Um, I'll, t I'll come back to that undesirable um, desirable a little bit um, because that does change and that's again why it also is very um, uh, land owner, land manager focused. We look at how, what the litter is doing on the soil surface, how the dung is decomposing, 
Um, and the really important indicators is how much bare soil, soil capping and erosion do you have. And then when we do the long-term monitoring, we also um, look at the lagging indicators of uh, the canopy covered by species. So we're actually counting on a line point transect exactly how many of different species that we, that we see. Um, and um, also look in kind of a flexible area to see if there are species that we um, haven't discovered yet in, on our line point. And we look at soil health and water infiltration. So here is um, how we really um, look to make are monitoring contextually relevant. So I'm in the Middle Rocky Mountain, Blue Mountains um, eco region. And so what I expect to see here is um, very different states and um, transitions to different states than I would, for example, in the sagebrush steppe of, of Wyoming or the Great Basin or, um, or where the Jefferson Center is. And one way to kind of look at this, so, so much of our ecology um, here is formed, for example, with um, rivers and, and canyons, where, at, where the Jefferson Center is, it's a very di a different kind of environment. And so um, this is just a way for us to say, okay, what do we really wanna have? So like, for example, um, this new ranch that Tony and I um, uh, purchased with some partners in 2018, um, it is very much an annual hay um, pasture, um, maybe a little bit of the, some perennial um, mix as well. Um, where our holistic context is, since we are really wanting to have as many plant species diversity to um, get our our cattle to finish off um, sooner and just really thrive. Um, we really want to move up to that that grassland where, where we have perennial grasses, brush, and forb mix. And that's a really interesting kind of place to think about because, um, like as you might, you can see possibly behind me. I will go. I'll grab it. This is a piece of, of soil um, that we dug last year. And um, so basically, the, and this was in July, and the grass is this tall, and um, I mean, some of it has kind of oxidized since it's been in our house, but, um, but the roots are only this tall. And so um, this um, ranch was used as a, as a, a hay ranch and also to graze cattle. Um, and it had a, an am, am, amazing amount of flood irrigation is um, whenever they really wanted. What we're able to do, it, um, what we've learned is that as we move away from these developed pastures into the grasslands, we are able to um, lower the amount of irrigation, sometimes eliminating irrigation altogether. So on our home place, what we have done is we have um, quit irrigating on, on the large part of the place and we have moved the succession from uh, having um, sedges, predominantly sedges and um, rushes and moving in to perennial grasses that have now are went from 24 inch um, tall to about 36 inch. So we've been able to greatly increase our production going from about 4,700 um, pounds per acre to 7,200 pounds per acre without irrigation. So this kind of way to look at the functional groups and, and, and moving um, the this, this, this succession of plants to where we want to be has been greatly um, more profitable for us, but also, um, you know, ecologically more sound.
So this is a picture of the Sorensons on um, the on a secret pass ranch in outside of Elko. An amazing, um, well managed place. So um, when um, we you know look at our implementation, so first we do um, that eco region setup and we create that state and transition, we look at reference areas thinking like how good could this place actually be? So for example, um, there might be, you know, oh, you can, for 80% of site potential, it gives you a really great um, bare ground score, for example. Well, bare ground, um, like where in my meadows, I should not have any bare ground. So it's all very um, contextually relevant. And then, and so the evaluation is as well. And then, I think I hear somebody not muted. <laughs> so, um, and then on the ground um, mapping. And so a lot of it's also um, doing a really good monitoring plan. And we're doing short term monitoring, which um, you that we also with training, um, the land manager can also um, learn to do that. And that's done every single year. And that's just what it's those leading indicators. The long term monitoring is, um, is done every five years. And then part of ELV is the quality assurance, that verification that um, comes into play. So um, this was some, this is some a short term um, monitoring that we did last year. Um, and so what we're looking at, so I was hired by, um, by the Blue Mountain Land Trust to um, do some monitoring. And what they really are starting to say is that it's not good enough, um, for, for example, for a conservation easement, just to not um, build houses there. What we, um, and what their funders are really looking at is that they want to see that ecological uplift. So um, somebody else can talk some, hopefully someday about our, the Savory Institute's land to market program and how um, EOV um, translates into that as well, but um, and to, just to give market assuredness, but we're also seeing other ecosystem services. So um, what we were able to see here is the weighted average for this ranch and what we were, what um, unfortunately um, it was highly degraded. So these weighted averages um, showed that, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of mineral cycle, especially, there was just not any, um, you know, things weren't breaking down and creating soil. So the potential of that score is 20. And so that was really informative for the managers, as well as for the funders. They're saying, okay, so what are you going to do next year? What do you? What do we want to see? Are we going to see more of the? Uh, there was a lot of annual grasses um, breaking down. We were able to, um, through training in um, holistic plan grazing, really be able to see, ha, huh, maybe may changing the the time of use with the with the animals. Um, you know, eat those annual grasses before um, they cure out and kind of get off the neck of the uh, other perennial grasses possibly later in the season. I guess it's what I'm trying to say here is that as a manager, it just really um, allows you to then focus on um, where am I gonna get the biggest bang for my, for my buck. Then the, so the long-term ecological monitoring um, it looks at changes over time. So um, it's, I should have twisted the, the, um, the, the diagram around, but so it's, it's looking in the opposite way. But this is um, a photographic point that looks at the entire area. And so there's a trapezoid that's made and, um, and 
so we have images over time. So this is looking then at the long-term monitoring data. And so um, you can see that um, like of the grasses, 46% were annual grasses and um, with 1% being cool season grasses. Uh, and um, you know, forbs and shrubs, the bare soil was 13% and litter cover 17%. And you can also just see the different attributes there. So the total score for this was um, a minus 50. Definitely a lot of room to go um, to regenerate. And I would say though that, and it's very interesting because when you go and look at it, it looks like there's a whole bunch of grass. Um, there are annual grasses, and but you actually see that there is, you know, things that are not, this, um, breaking down, there's kind of a thatch cover, um, and um, dung is not decomposing. And uh, what's interesting is there wasn't a lot of bare ground because of that thatch cover, but the capping in the water erosion was significant. And then we also look at um, the infiltration rates. Um, actually, the, the infiltration rate was, was pretty good. And um, also, this is the Cornell test um, for um, soil um, health. We also do um, looking at total carbon as well. And so the overall quality score was very interesting in terms of Cornell, it, which was 91. So, um, and I think that um, what that really told us is that we still have time in, to really regenerate this piece of land. So um, just to how I've been able to look at this. So again, we worked with, um, I, I think that there's just a lot of opportunities for using EOV in, um, in different instances. So if you can be a producer that's part of the land to market program and um, supply um, beef or lamb or leather, uh, wool, that your, the buyers are, are really um, confident that you're moving towards regeneration. Um, it can be used for uh, other ecosystem services. So for example, we're really, um, interested in making sure that we have third-party tracking. Um, so we're doing some work on river restoration and um, actually moving some rivers, rechannelizing them. Um, the tendency is when people do that kind of work that they want to limit um, all cattle grazing. Um, what we are going to be able to show is that we have the data that says we need to have the cattle grazing. Um, and it's really the, the time and timing of that grazing. Uh, there's other ecosystem um, services in terms of carbon um, sequestration that this also looks at. And, um, but I really feel like for the, the biggest bang for the buck is the having this really great knowledge so that um, you can say, I'm increasing my, I'm doubling my production, or these are the kind of the plants that, that I really want to see, and this is what I need to do in order to um, see those kind of plants. So um, it's just, you know, fundamental to our management. And that's that. I would love to take some questions. Awesome. Thanks, Andrea. So if you want to ask a question, we have about 28 people today. So if you wanted to unmute, simply unmute your um, microphone, and then you can ask a question. Or you, if you feel more comfortable doing that, you can um, type it in the chat window. Any questions? I'm sure there are some out there. There's no such thing as a silly question. <laughs> hey, thank you for the talk. 
Hey, hi. Hey, hey Steven. Hey, Abby. Hi. Um, just a question on, you just said something at the very end about uh, you'll have the data to show uh, that cattle grazing is necessary. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so um, this is my pets particularly. Um, so right now is that, so um, on rivers, like there's, there are governmental programs, for example, that fence out rivers um, from cattle grazing. Um, the, the, the thought is that, you know, cattle can just mingle and, and stay on a river if they're allowed to for a very long time. So um, what we are able to show is that with, um, in one year, we are already have willows coming up and we have um, looked at, um, and we had cattle on, on the river. It's just that we uh, manage the time and timing. Another example is that there um, was the sage grouse example that the the livestock really um, created that kind of mosaic of of cover and as well as, um, as well as being able to uh, allow um, the baby chicks the early broodering sage so that it allowed them to be able to um, walk and and um, stay away from predators, um, but also have movement. So, did that answer your question? I think so. I guess I, I, I read some of the peer reviewed literature and I know that EOV is collecting a lot of data, but I guess I'm just curious if that data is going to be shared. Um, in a way, I guess just to make that case so much stronger, like to, I guess especially the difference between people who I talk to and think like all those things would happen without the cattle, uh, to just really drive home the point that it's because of uh, managing the cattle properly. Yeah, you know, just really using the, like we look at grazing and animal impact are tools that are necessary. Um, the other, the example of where there, that, the um, ranch was very dominated by annual um, grasses. There wasn't a lot of species richness. Um, you know, I think that people would would think, oh, that needs to be, maybe that needs to be rested or is it overgrazing that caused it? Actually, what, we're, what we saw is that um, we, I, you know, that the ranchers and the managers were able to see, oh, we actually need to have massive animal impact early on the spring and um, utilize that those annual grasses at that time when they're palatable, and then maybe t um, take some time off and just change the use later on. So it's really, again, focusing on that time and timing. Um, there's some really good, there's a good literature um, review that, um, that Jason Rontree and others wrote on the looking at the environmental health index. So, um, and so it's really, it gives you a chance to say, okay, this is what we did. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter if you have doubled your production and you have a whole bunch of species diversity. Um, like, how'd you do that? It's like, oh, it is, it was through livestock. So maybe that will be the opening that people say, oh, okay, we have that data. Thanks. Great, other questions? I could keep I going. I oh, hi there, my name is Claire. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you see a connection between soil health and genetically modified organisms. Oh, I, it's way out of my, um, my knowledge area. Okay. Thank you. Can somebody else answer that? <laughs> yeah, please feel free to unmute if you have thoughts on the question. Can I ask something else in, in the in between? Yeah. 
Um, so I'm kind of curious more just now about the program. Who who are the people that are certified like to do EOB? Um, I guess what do you call them? Uh, checks. Yeah. So we're, we have monitors and we have um, master verifiers. Um, do you want to speak to that, Abby? Since you were a head of a hub. Sure. So the. Um, I'll turn on my camera too. The, there are um, different roles within the EOV program. So one of them is a master verifier, and that's what Andrea is and what Spencer is as well. And those are the um, people who have the knowledge and the skills and uh, are equipped to um, set up hubs as um, in the EOV program. And then when they're there, they train, <coughs> excuse me, the hub team which includes what we call a hub verifier. And then we also have a monitors on the team as well. And so each of those roles has certain responsibilities and permissions that they can do and that their role is designed to do. Um, and there's also certain qualifications that are needed. For example, um, in order to be a hub verifier, you also need to be a savory field professional. And, um, but to be a monitor, you don't need to have that training in place. Um, does that help? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I what I wanted to know. Thank you. Great, great, happy to help. Anyone else have questions? We have some time. We can dig into some bigger topics if you'd like as well. And I, so I think that's one thing that's very interesting too, just with how it's set up, is that. Um, so we look at things like functional groups, but I am not an expert at all on um, being able to identify ever, every single species of plant. So I have partnered with a, a woman, Dallas Hall DeFries, that is an expert in plant ID. Um, but what my background at, as a, a field professional is, it's like, so here are the plants, what are they trying to tell us? What, here's the soil surface. What is the soil surface trying to tell us? And then being able to um, inform um, management or to have land managers really um, see things differently. What's interesting, like what I, when I came back from um, Nevada and the Sorensen's place is that they had an amazing, um, the soil surface just covered so well. And it just really, I think in some respects, it was, it's kind of like um, Mimi's place as well, is that the data just starts, it can be so encouraging. Um, and then when it's not, when things are pretty degraded, it's like, oh, okay, now I know what to do. This is what I, I can make some decisions and we're gonna assume we're wrong. That's what we do in holistic management, but at least it, it's not like you're like, oh, what do we do with, um, you know, this, you know, uh, annual grass that we don't want. It gives the manager ideas. So I think that's also kind of the, the roles as well. So a sh um, in, like a land manager can do it when, once they get training, which the Jefferson Center is doing some great things in terms of training land managers to actually do their own short term monitoring and then get verified um, every five years um, as well. I see um, Mimi um, writes in, um, my mic is not working, so how can EOV help with marketing? Um, Again, maybe, do you wanna talk a little bit, um, Abby, about um, the, the land to market program? Sure, so, so um, EOV is, is about the data and what we're seeing coming off of the land. And then when we wanna to start to tell the story about that data, data to, uh, to our customers or um, clients or, or people who would be consuming that product um, or products that come off that land, Anytime we start telling the story of the data, that is now part of the land to market program. So there's certain um, ways that we need to communicate about that data. There's certain um, permissions around labeling or not labeling, but like um, uses of the, of the brand and everything that need to be considered. So um, I just wanted to lay that framework. And I think that 
with EOV um, inside of the land to market program, right, when we're talking about the data, it can tell the story of, um, of the land in a, in a real way, in a way that's data backed and um, allows people not to, to not fall victim to greenwashing and, and other things, but they, they know that the, the product that they're consuming or that you know, they're receiving a message about has truly helped regenerate land um, because it's data backed. Does that help Mimi? Does I answer the question? I need drink more. But yes. <laughs> Great. And I think that I don't, maybe I didn't give a, enough of a background either, but um, you know, grasslands, um, they're, you know, very keen on showing um, the power of uh, properly managed livestock. And um, so I think the mar marketing is what the land and market is actually products. But um, in terms of conservation easements, I look at ecosystem services as, uh, as markets as well. Um, I think that we, Tony and I probably have... Um, that's probably the real crux of our business is, is having those um, ecosystem services. So just being able to have that third party data. Um, and then this isn't really related to marketing as much, but um, in terms of just the potential, especially if you're on public land or something like that, to um, be able to show um, your, your, you know, resource base, what you're doing. So the human resource base. So that can be politically, um, it can be, um, it, and it can be just regulatory as well. Awesome. Thanks, Andrea. Anyone else feel like they want to ask a question of Andrea? Um, as a master verifier, as a field professional? Um, I know people have some. Well, if you um, think of anything later, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my mm -hmm. contact information yeah. is Andrea at lifeenergy.guide. Awesome, and I will share, I'm gonna do a closing slide as well, Andrea, so we'll do that right now. If we're, if we're closed, if we're ready to close. Um, let me see where, it, there it is. All right, so this is just a, a way to, you can see Andrea's um, contact information and, my, and Spencer's and my contact information as well, as, as well as our, our website and um, phone numbers, or my phone number. So please feel free to reach out to us with other questions or if you want to engage with EOV or, um, we're happy to help. Andrea, anything else you'd like to add to close? Um, oh, the other, I guess one other thing is that you could visit um, Tony's blog, my husband's blog, where we um, are putting also some of our data on there just to kind of tell our story. And so um, that is holisticmanagement.guide. So um, pretty easy to remember that one I think. That's my, I dropped that one in the chat. If I spelled it right. Perfect. You did. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for your time this morning. And um, I hope we'll get to meet with you next month. Thank you so much. And Andrea, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thanks for hosting. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.